Cleopatra, the Queen of Egypt, a world-renowned woman. She had the most significant influence on the history of the Nilotic people, not only because she was a mesmerizing beauty of Egypt over 2,000 years ago and the last queen of a doomed dynasty, but also because her love triangle with Caesar and Antony stirred people's hearts, influencing the history of Egypt and the world at that time. In order to protect the interests of the Kingdom of Egypt and prevent the Romans from seizing the Mediterranean, Queen Cleopatra enacted maritime laws, achieving this not with her talent, but with her exquisite beauty that made Caesar, the Roman hero, and Antony kneel before her. Her beauty and actions influenced history, leading to criticism and debates among historians of that time. At the same time, it influenced writers, artists, and philosophers afterwards, and even revolutionaries, becoming a subject of artistic and cinematic creation in today's world. Truly, she was a queen like no other in world history. In Pascal's Pensées, he once said, if Cleopatra's nose had been a little shorter, the face of the world would have changed. Pascal's statement, the face of the world would have changed, refers to the changing course of history at that time. The significance of this statement is that Cleopatra, with her unparalleled beauty, attracted the fame of Caesar and Antony from Rome thereby influencing the history of Egypt and Rome. If her nose had been a little shorter, history would not be as it is today. Among the many descriptions and evaluations of Queen Cleopatra, there are praises and criticisms, fairness and bias. Some slandered her as a seductress, a sorceress, the femme fatale who corrupted Roman soldiers. Some praised her as a beautiful queen, knowledgeable and persuasive, embodying the spirit of Egypt. The sisters united to defend their military rights, the Nile River originates from the Ethiopian highlands in East Africa, merging with the blue and white Nile rivers of Uganda and then flowing into Sudan. It resembles a large serpent of Africa, crossing the North African desert and emptying into the Mediterranean Sea. The mouth of the Nile forms a triangular shape, covering an area of several square kilometers, like the open jaws of a mighty serpent. This great serpent is both awe-inspiring and terrifying. It benefits agriculture, irrigation, and farming, ensuring abundant food for the people of Egypt. However, it also causes annual floods, resulting in significant human and material losses on both banks. Nevertheless, Egypt is the gift of the Nile, because the Nile River is the mother river of Egypt. The Nile River divides Egypt into two major geographical regions, the southern part from the Sudanese border to the long, narrow stretch of Cairo spanning over 750 kilometers and ranging from 20 to 50 kilometers wide. Historically, this region is called Upper Egypt. The northern part extends from Cairo to the delta area of the Mediterranean Sea and is known as Lower Egypt. Around 4000 BCE, Upper and Lower Egypt formed their separate kingdoms. Between Upper and Lower Egypt, conflicts and wars frequently occurred. Around 3000 BCE, King Menes of Upper Egypt conquered Lower Egypt, initiating the unification of Egypt. Menes established the first dynasty of Egypt, marking the beginning of a united kingdom. From then until 332 BCE, ancient Egypt went through various kingdoms, including the Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, and New Kingdom, along with periods of foreign invasions and dominations. In total, it experienced 30 dynasties. Throughout its long history of over 2,600 years, the people of Egypt created a brilliant ancient civilization, with famous landmarks such as the Great Pyramids and the iconic Sphinx in the vicinity of Cairo. The temples of Thebes, the tomb of Tutankhamun, and the palace of Amarna, among others, are celebrated as ancient wonders of the world, veiling this ancient kingdom of civilization in a mysterious aura. Around the 4th century BCE, the kingdom of Macedonia gradually grew stronger and became a military power through the reforms of Philip II. Alexander, son of Philip II, continued his father's policy of expansion and invasion. In 332 BCE, he defeated the Persian army, conquered Asia Minor, Syria, and finally Egypt. Upon entering Egypt, Alexander won over the Egyptian administrators by disguising himself as the son of the god Amun, becoming the new pharaoh of Egypt. After Alexander's death, the empire fragmented. Ptolemy, a general from Alexandria, officially declared himself king in the wealthiest nation of Egypt in 305 BCE, establishing the Ptolemaic dynasty and making Alexandria the capital. The Ptolemaic dynasty inherited the traditions of the Egyptian kingdom and implemented an autocratic monarchy, maintaining all the institutions of ancient Egypt, 
they ruthlessly exploited and oppressed the Egyptian people, sparking resistance and struggles. The people rose up in rebellion multiple times, challenging the central authority. Rival factions within the court plotted against each other, and individuals vied for the throne, either taking advantage of popular uprisings or relying on the support of the Roman forces to claim the crown. Cleopatra is the daughter of Ptolemy the Porith, born in 69 BC. She was the most significant figure in the palace intrigues and violent struggles, which further enhanced her intelligence and courage, making her a cunning and talented woman, abundant in charm and beauty. Ptolemy the Porith, her co-ruler, was exiled and died in Rome. Prior to that, in order to ascend to the throne, he made a secret agreement with Julius Caesar, the Roman general. If Rome could help him regain his kingship, he would provide Rome with 17.5 million denarii. Seizing this opportunity, Rome invaded and gradually made the Ptolemaic dynasty more dependent on them. At the age of 18, Cleopatra's co-ruler, Ptolemy the Puanth, passed away. According to legend, the right to inherit ancient Egypt did not belong to the prince, but to the eldest daughter of the king. This meant that even the legitimate offspring of the king had to marry the princess with the right to inherit the throne to become the new ruler. As a result, in order to maintain pure bloodline, the ancient Egyptian kings gradually established the tradition of marrying their siblings. Therefore, Ptolemy the Fuan, Cleopatra's co-ruler, created a will for Cleopatra, who was 18 years old, and Ptolemy the Fertinth, her 12-year-old younger brother, to marry and jointly rule. In 51 BC, Cleopatra and Ptolemy the Fertinth became co-rulers, jointly ruling Upper and Lower Egypt. Since Cleopatra was a woman on the throne and Ptolemy the Thirteenth was young, at that time, the actual power was mainly held by three individuals, the chief minister Potinus, the general Achilles, and the scholar Theodotus. These three individuals fundamentally disregarded the young king and queen and made significant decisions without seeking the approval of the king and queen, acting on their own. Other influential figures in the Ptolemaic court were also arrogant and authoritarian. In reality, Ptolemy XIII and Cleopatra became king and queen only in name. The true power was controlled by the chief minister, leaving them dissatisfied. Therefore, Cleopatra negotiated with her younger brother, planning to remove these three powerful individuals and seize power from their hands. However, Cleopatra forgot that within the dynasty, power also had its own arrangements. Although Ptolemy XIII was young, he did not want to be controlled and manipulated by his sister. He not only refused to cooperate with her, but also formed an alliance with the three powerful individuals to oppose and suppress Cleopatra. During Cleopatra's regency, assassination was prevalent within the Egyptian royal court. Cleopatra's sister suddenly died, allegedly poisoned. Another sister of Cleopatra was also assassinated due to a dispute with the co-ruler. Today, Cleopatra's younger brother, who is also her husband, colluded with the three powerful individuals to confront her putting her life in danger. As a result, she had no choice but to patiently wait for the right moment, being forced to leave the capital of Alexandria and flee to Syria. Cleopatra was a beautiful and intelligent queen with both wisdom and courage. She was determined to confront her younger brother in the face of adversity. Cleopatra faced a rare opportunity. The fiery figure of Caesar, the ruler of Rome, entered the midst of the struggle between Cleopatra and her brother. How did Caesar manage to insert himself into the internal strife of the Egyptian royal court? There was another underlying reason for this. Previously, Caesar held an important position in Rome, along with Pompey and Crassus, two other influential figures. In 60 BC, they formed a secret alliance known as the First Triumvirate to oppose the aristocratic Senate. The First Triumvirate was a temporary political alliance, and each individual had their own ambitions— which inevitably led to internal conflicts. In 53 BC, during the Parthian campaign, Caesar defeated Pompey and then engaged in a civil war with him. With the support of farmers, urban middle class, and dissenting knights, Caesar opposed the rule of the aristocratic senate. In the border campaign of Pharsalus in Greece, Pompey was completely defeated and fled to Egypt, pursued by Caesar's army. When Caesar's forces pursued Pompey to the Egyptian capital Alexandria, Pompey was assassinated by the Egyptians. The reason was that shortly after Pompey's arrival in Egypt, the Egyptian king received news that Caesar was leading a large and powerful army to pursue him. Ptolemy XIII, the Egyptian king, 
and his courtiers believed that if Pompey were received, it would incur Caesar's wrath and be disadvantageous to Egypt. Therefore, Ptolemy XIII took the opportunity to plot the assassination of General Pompey. Consequently, Caesar had a valid reason to stay in the Egyptian capital, Alexandria, and discuss matters with the Egyptian king. When Ptolemy XII was in exile in Rome, he secretly signed a pre-agreement with Caesar for a reward. In that year, Caesar and Ptolemy XII reached a secret agreement at the conference, assisting Ptolemy XII in returning to power. And in 48 BC, when Caesar arrived in Egypt, Ptolemy XII had been back for three years. Ptolemy XII stated during the negotiations that if Rome failed to protect the position of Cleopatra and Ptolemy XIII, the Egyptian monarchy would refuse to pay the reward. At this time, Ptolemy XIII held the power of Egypt alone, and his sister, who was Cleopatra, was in exile in Syria. The situation was that Caesar, in order to receive his reward, had to first reconcile these two feuding sisters. Therefore, Caesar sent an envoy to Syria to visit Cleopatra, hoping to bring her back to Egypt and mend the conflict between the two sisters. Cleopatra received Caesar's emissary, knowing that in order to regain her lost power, she would need Caesar's assistance. Seeing Caesar's decision as beneficial to herself, Cleopatra believed that she had to quickly arrange a meeting with Caesar before her younger brother. Consequently, she immediately decided to embark on a secret journey, accompanied by her most intelligent confidant, a brave and loyal Sixili man named Apollos, with the intention of using her beauty and wit to captivate Caesar. As Cleopatra approached the capital, Alexandria, she decided to switch to a small boat, taking advantage of the cover of darkness to approach the palace. Cleopatra understood that upon returning to the palace in Alexandria, she would be in danger from the divine authority of Portanos and the threat of Achilles' assassination. At this crucial moment, Cleopatra's intelligence and cunning became evident. Accompanying her was Apollos, a brave and resourceful Sicily man who was also her beloved. Cleopatra devised a plan for Apollos to carry a rolled-up carpet, with her hidden in the middle of it. Apollos pretended to be a carpet-bearer and entered the palace, carrying the carpet into Caesar's room through a rear entrance. Cleopatra succeeded in her scheme. Not only did she deceive the king and his divine entourage with their watchful eyes, but also, as if by magic, a beautiful woman suddenly emerged from the carpet, a gift from the gods. All these sudden and miraculous events astonished Caesar. Plautarchus evaluated this scheme, saying, By making Caesar her captive, Cleopatra can be said to have enchanted his appearance, fulfilling the first step of her strategy. After being amazed, Caesar's heart was immediately captivated by Cleopatra's beauty. Her beauty was incomparable, her posture exuded the confidence of a young woman, and she possessed an enchanting power that could conquer people's hearts. Despite being over twenty years old, she resembled a youthful maiden with a slender figure. She had large, shining black eyes that exuded charisma, a high, noble nose that surpassed the beauty of ordinary women, and long, jet-black hair that enhanced her soft, fair complexion, giving her body a gem-like radiance. Her slightly smiling lips held a deep and mysterious charm. Cleopatra's presence caused Caesar's heart to beat erratically. As Cleopatra conversed with Caesar, her extensive knowledge and intelligence gradually mesmerized him. Historians of that time believed that Cleopatra's magical quick-wittedness in conversation had a captivating effect on people. She was well-versed in history, Greek literature, and philosophy, and she spoke fluently in six languages. She not only possessed the strategic vision of a military leader and the intelligence of a negotiator, but also knew how to perform like a skilled actress. Plautarchus described this as follows. The queen had enough enchanting power to render her opponents defenseless. Her words were highly persuasive, and her voice was as clear as a gem. The sound of the queen was sweet, like the melodious strings of a joyful harp. She could use multiple languages and converse skillfully, without the need for translation, whether it was with someone from Ethiopia, Hebrew, Jewish, Arabic, Syrian, Melanesian, or Parthian. She could speak directly. She was not only a woman of external beauty, but also an exceptional woman with inner beauty. Caesar was not only captivated by Cleopatra's beauty, but also conquered by her talents. At this point, Caesar began to trust and elevate Cleopatra to a position of wisdom. Therefore, when he mediated the conflict between Cleopatra and Ptolemy XIII, he clearly leaned towards Cleopatra. Pressured by Caesar's military forces, Ptolemy XIII outwardly agreed to reconcile with his sister, 
but internally he conspired with Portanos, Achilles, and Titus to discuss countermeasures. Portanos, Achilles, and Titus planned to assassinate Caesar, similar to the plot against Pompey. After their plot was exposed, Portanos was executed, and Achilles and Titus fled from the palace, mobilizing their army to engage in a decisive battle against Caesar. Thus, the War of Alexander began in history. As the war began, the external situation for Caesar was difficult. His army in Egypt was limited, and the supplies after arriving in Egypt were also restricted. His aggressive interference in Egyptian politics, particularly the execution of high-ranking Egyptian officials, provoked the anger and resistance of the Egyptian people. Behind this resistance was the manipulation of Ptolemy XIII. The Egyptian army besieged Caesar's Roman army, and the people of Alexandria surrounded the palace for seven months. Caesar had to go to the Nile Delta to negotiate for military aid from the Roman troops stationed in the east and west. Eventually, the Roman army counterattacked the Egyptian army, achieving victory and successfully suppressing the resistance of the people of Alexandria. After the war ended, Cleopatra and Ptolemy XIV, another younger brother, entered into a politically motivated marriage as siblings and officially ascended to the throne. Caesar also moved into the palace and stayed with Cleopatra. Since Cleopatra ascended to the throne, she perhaps wanted to showcase Egypt's wealth to Caesar and solidify her own position. She also wanted the Egyptian people to acknowledge Caesar as her husband and to recognize his greatness. In the second spring, she organized a grand boat race on the Nile. Cleopatra and Caesar spent several weeks on a luxurious yacht sailing upstream, accompanied by 400 soldiers, entertainers, musicians, flowers, fine wine, and delicious food. Eventually, Cleopatra's younger brother mysteriously died, and she calmly seized the throne for herself. At the same time, those who pursued Pompey were regrouping their forces in North Africa and Spain to resist Caesar. While Caesar was touring the Nile, instead of returning to Alexandria, he took his army to North Africa and Spain to eliminate the resistance. In less than a year, Caesar led his troops back to Rome. Rome celebrated Caesar's great triumph, and in 46 BC, a grand triumphal ceremony was held. During this time, Cleopatra gave birth to their son, Caesarian, also known as Caesar's son, in June. Cleopatra and Caesarian came to Rome to attend the celebration of the triumph, and they stayed in Rome. Caesar provided them with a beautiful villa residence. The Queen of Egypt, along with her son, arrived in Rome, not only influencing the social life of Rome, but also changing its political landscape. She brought her minting workshop from Alexandria, replacing the Roman mint. She also invited Egyptian bankers to assist Caesar in arranging tax plans. She invited Egyptian astronomers to rectify the Roman calendar, establishing a more scientifically advanced solar calendar system. Additionally, she helped Rome construct a large-scale library similar to the Library of Alexandria. Caesar was captivated by Cleopatra's beauty, and she used Caesar's influence to achieve her goals. In order to make Cleopatra his legitimate wife, Caesar enacted a law allowing for multiple wives. To expand Cleopatra's influence in Rome, Caesar commissioned a noble statue in the Temple of Venus, dedicated to her. He also issued coins depicting Cleopatra and their son, Lion. In order to fulfill Cleopatra's wishes, Caesar planned to make Alexandria the capital of a new Roman Empire and intended to appoint Lion as his successor. Caesar's actions were met with opposition from the Roman elite, which led to many enemies. On the Ides of March, in the year 44 BC, the entire Roman Senate convened in the Senate House, and suddenly a group of conspirators launched a surprise attack on Caesar. They advanced with swords and daggers, striking him relentlessly. A total of 23 stabs pierced his body, with blood spurting from his face flowing into his eyes. Finally, a sharp blade was plunged into his chest, causing him to fall in front of the sculpted statue of Pompey, his former rival. Caesar's assassination left Cleopatra without support. Her current state of mind and expression remain unknown. It is only known that during that battle, Rome was plunged into a deep power struggle, and some sought the assistance of Queen Cleopatra. However, Cleopatra was an astute individual who refrained from prematurely revealing her intentions. She carefully followed the strategies outlined in Book 765, silently observing the situation in Rome and waiting to see who would succeed Caesar. To avoid becoming deeply entangled in Rome's internal struggle, a year later she boarded a ship with Leon and returned to Alexandria, where she ruled over Egypt for the next three years. 
After Caesar's death, power in Rome was contested for over six months. In October of 43 BC, a parallel situation emerged with the Second Triumvirate consisting of Octavian, Caesar's adopted son, Antony, Caesar's general, and Lepidus, a cavalry officer. Octavian governed the western provinces of Rome, Antony was responsible for the eastern provinces, and Lepidus ruled over Africa. However, this parallel situation only lasted for a short period. Octavian swiftly imprisoned Lepidus, and Rome's territory was divided between Octavian and Antony, creating a standoff between the two factions. Egypt, under Antony's rule, encompassed the eastern provinces and was the wealthiest region. According to legend, when Antony assumed the role of commander of Cassius's diplomatic mission in Rome, he had previously encountered Cleopatra when she was 14 or 15 years old. When Cleopatra became the beloved of Caesar, Antony was also captivated by her. At that time, in his governed provinces, Antony heard that Cleopatra opposed Cassius providing military funds. Consequently, Antony sent an invitation to Cleopatra to negotiate in Tarsus, a city in Asia Minor. Cleopatra, considering herself Caesar's wife, was dissatisfied that Antony, who was Caesar's general, dared to entice her. However, fearing Antony's power, Cleopatra knew she couldn't be stubborn. She brought her entourage, adorned her royal barge with luxurious gold and jewels, and embarked on her journey to Tarsus. Cleopatra believed that her beauty and intelligence would surely conquer Antony's heart. When the queen's barge arrived in Tarsus, Antony was delivering a speech in the city's central square. As soon as people heard the music and caught the intoxicating scent emanating from the barge, they immediately abandoned Antony's speech and rushed to the riverbank to admire the beauty of the Egyptian queen. Instead of disembarking and paying homage to Antony, Cleopatra dropped anchor and waited for Antony to come aboard and greet her. Antony sent someone to invite Queen Cleopatra to a banquet, but she declined and invited Antony to her own barge that night. Antony was soon aware of Cleopatra's arrogance but was unaware of the contrary outcome. The Roman general was submissive, his heart restless, filled with excitement and blinded by love, knowing nothing other than boarding the queen's barge. When he saw the queen's grand barge adorned with countless colorful lanterns resembling a floating palace, he felt a sense of awe. Cleopatra also brought a large amount of gold, precious jewels, horses, slaves, and other treasures from Egypt, and her recent preparations enhanced her elegance and matched her status as a great queen. That evening's banquet was extravagant beyond imagination, with a wide variety of delicacies, exotic foods that astonished Antony, who praised without end. When the banquet concluded, Queen Cleopatra presented Antony with golden cups, silver plates, exquisitely crafted wine vessels, luxurious sleeping couches, and embroidered ornaments that they had just used, all symbolizing her affection for him. On the second day, in return for the courtesy, Antony invited Cleopatra once again. He endeavored to make his banquet even more splendid and ostentatious than the queen's, but the result was crude and inferior. Antony found himself humbled before the beautiful queen, feeling small and inadequate in her presence. Queen Cleopatra repeatedly invited Antony and his entourage to attend parties, showering them with gifts she brought along. Her purpose was not to please Antony but to showcase Egypt's wealth, demonstrating to him the value and power of an alliance with Egypt. Her strategy proved effective. Antony, a fearless military general, had conquered everywhere and disregarded everything. Even his wife Fulvia had failed to capture his heart. Many renowned and gentle women had gone unnoticed by him, but now he was enchanted by this Egyptian queen. Antony called Cleopatra the serpent of the Nile's shore, and Cleopatra referred to Antony as the Roman wolf. The hero had a hard time resisting the enchantment of the beauty. The beauty had intoxicated the hero. This is the one who will pave the way for his downfall. After spending three months with Queen Cleopatra in Tarsus, Antony left his former wife and followed Cleopatra to Alexandria, the capital of Egypt, where they spent the entire winter. Queen Cleopatra sometimes accompanied Antony on fishing trips by the seaside. Strangely, the fish only bit Antony's bait and not the queen's. Cleopatra found it very strange and carefully observed that Antony used underwater divers to attach fish to his line. Cleopatra did not confront him. After returning to the palace, she boasted to everyone that Antony was an excellent fisherman. On the following day, to showcase Antony's fishing skills, Cleopatra invited many people to join Antony by the seaside. 
Cleopatra had her divers place a large dried saltwater fish from the Black Sea on Antony's line. When Antony pulled up the line, he looked pale and shocked, and everyone burst into laughter. By Antony's side, Cleopatra whispered with profound meaning, You can catch a bigger fish, the capital, the king, and the continent. Her intention was to awaken Antony, lest he sink further into the abyss of sensual pleasure. However, the heroic spirit of Antony had declined. His will had waned, his mind had become sluggish, and he could not lift himself up. At this time, the political situation of the Roman Empire was restless and unstable. Antony's wife and brother led troops against Octavian, but were defeated by Octavian's formidable army. Consequently, Antony had to leave Alexandria and return to Rome, determined to confront Octavian. Octavian staunchly resisted Antony's return to Rome, and it took the intervention of a mediator to achieve a temporary compromise. Six months after Antony left Egypt, Queen Cleopatra gave birth to twins, her children with Antony, named Alexander Helios and Cleopatra Selene. During the years of separation from Antony, Cleopatra demonstrated her talent for governing the country. Her defensive forces grew stronger, she developed the navy, and she focused on agricultural production and livestock breeding, accumulating a substantial amount of wealth. During this time, Octavian realized that he did not possess enough power to defeat Antony and arranged for his sister to marry Antony. Although Antony accepted Octavian's arrangement, his feelings for his sister were not deep. In his heart, he never stopped thinking about Queen Cleopatra. In 37 BC, Antony abandoned Octavian's sister, returned to Alexandria, and officially married Queen Cleopatra, ruling Egypt together. In the wedding ceremony, everyone melted down coins, and the molten metal was poured over the heads of the couple, creating a clinking sound as it fell, symbolizing the ceremonial style of a royal marriage. From that moment, the reign of Queen Cleopatra entered a new era, and her love with Antony embarked on a new stage. In reality, the scales of Cleopatra's love were not as heavy as the weight of her dynasty's career in Antony's heart. However, she bound her dynasty's career and Antony's existence tightly together, leading to the tragic events that would unfold later. In the year 36 BC, Cleopatra, at the age of 33, and Antony launched a military campaign against Persia. However, when their army reached the Euphrates River, Cleopatra decided to halt the advance due to her pregnancy. In that autumn, she gave birth to her and Antony's third child, named Ptolemaios. During the winter, Antony continued the campaign alone, while Cleopatra sent supplies and reinforcements to support him, rescuing him from defeat. This deepened Antony's love for Cleopatra. To show his gratitude and gain favor with the Queen of Egypt, Antony appointed Caesar and Cleopatra's son, Caesarion, as the crown prince. He declared Cleopatra as the Queen of Egypt. He also gave the regions of Armenia and Media to Alexander Helios, Cleopatra and Antony's son, and Phoenicia, Syria, and Greece to Ptolemy Philadelphus their younger son. Although Antony was a brave warrior, he lacked the political acumen of a statesman. He gave away Roman territories to Cleopatra and her children, which weakened his position in the power struggle in Rome. Additionally, he abandoned his wife Octavia, causing resentment among the Roman people. To further fuel the Roman people's animosity towards Antony, Octavian revealed Antony's will, which stated his intention to make Alexandria the capital of Rome, implying that he wanted to give all of Rome to the rebellious Egyptian queen. Cleopatra, aware of Octavian's intentions and his status as her main enemy, used various means to persuade Antony to focus their forces on fighting Octavian. She convinced Antony to take two actions, formally divorce Octavia and command the navy to invade Greece. In 32 BC, unexpectedly, they launched a surprise attack on Octavian. At that time, Cleopatra's influence reached its peak. The rulers of Mediterranean countries pledged their allegiance to her, and the people of Athens revered her, even erecting statues and honoring her as the goddess Aphrodite. This systematic strategy of Cleopatra and Antony provoked Octavian, leading to a war between the two sides. The decisive battle took place on land and sea, primarily near the Akumu coast in western Greece. Antony's land forces had a significant advantage over Octavian's, and many urged Antony to confront Octavian on land. However, Cleopatra insisted on engaging in naval combat, believing that the combined fleet of Antony and Egypt would be stronger than Octavian's naval forces, increasing their chances of victory. 
Some of Antony's generals strongly opposed Cleopatra's involvement in the battle. They insulted her and spread rumors that the war was caused by her influence. Despite Cleopatra's anger, she remained determined to participate in the naval battle. She said, Strike at Rome's weakness so that our opponents cannot weave any more plots. On September 2, 31 BC, Antony and Cleopatra led an army of 100,000 and a fleet of 500 ships, while Octavian commanded 80,000 infantry, 12,000 cavalry, and 250 ships. The battle took place primarily at sea, although both land and sea forces were involved. The initial strength of both armies was relatively equal, and they were evenly matched. Antony and Cleopatra's ships were larger, while Octavian's were smaller. Overcoming larger ships with smaller ones was challenging, so Octavian employed flexible guerrilla tactics. He sent numerous small boats to surround and attack Antony and Cleopatra's larger ships, using fire as a weapon. Antony and Cleopatra's larger ships had disadvantages due to their bulky size and lack of maneuverability, making them vulnerable to the smaller boats. Octavian, after more than a year of fighting in the Egyptian territory, gradually realized that he had to eliminate his final rival and sever the alliance of Antony and Cleopatra. Therefore, he sent an emissary to Cleopatra, offering her the guarantee of her position as queen if she would abandon Antony and align herself with Octavian. Cleopatra, trusting Octavian's promise, decided not to aid Antony any further. As a result, Octavian's invading forces swiftly advanced into Egypt, causing Antony's army and navy to crumble immediately. With his strength depleted, Antony was overcome with despair. At this moment, Cleopatra employed her cunning and feminine wiles to deceive Antony. She dispatched an envoy to inform Antony that Queen Cleopatra had taken her own life. In reality, Cleopatra had not committed suicide, but she instructed the envoy to carefully observe Antony's reaction upon hearing the news. However, she soon realized that this deception had inflicted too great a blow upon Antony. Eventually, the envoy informed Antony that Cleopatra was indeed alive, but it was too late. Upon hearing of his lover's supposed death, Antony was consumed by grief and immediately decided to take his own life. He plunged a short sword into his abdomen, but the wound was not deep enough to cause immediate death. Wanting Cleopatra and Antony to rest together in the same tomb after their passing, Queen Cleopatra had a grand mausoleum constructed. When the queen secluded herself within the mausoleum, news reached her that Antony had taken his own life. She promptly instructed a secret agent to bring Antony to the tomb. Upon meeting Cleopatra, the two embraced and wept. Finally, Antony died in the arms of his beloved. Queen Cleopatra, now bereft of Antony, felt immense sorrow. However, driven by her desire to protect her kingdom, she also sought to use her beauty to overthrow Octavian. She adorned herself and went to meet Octavian, demanding recognition of her continued reign as queen. But by this time Queen Cleopatra, nearing the age of forty, had lost the beauty and allure that had captivated both Caesar and Antony. Octavian too was not Caesar or Antony. His ideal was to create a powerful and united Roman Empire. He decided to capture Queen Cleopatra and her children as prisoners and parade them through the streets of Rome in a triumphant procession, making the kingdom of Egypt his personal possession. The dream of an emperor vanished. Queen Cleopatra, feeling there was no escape and fearing becoming Octavian's captive, subjected herself to self-inflicted death. As the ruler of a nation, she chose to perish along with her kingdom. To further magnify his triumph, Octavian, while making a lenient promise to Cleopatra, also warned her that if she were to commit suicide, he would kill all her children and appoint a strict guard to watch over her. With her indomitable spirit, Queen Cleopatra viewed death as a return. She used the pretext of cleaning Antony's tomb to request permission to venture outside. When her procession reached a major thoroughfare, she made contact with loyal confidants. Returning to her palace, she viewed a few possessions, cleansed herself, and had her servants dress her like Venus. Then she proceeded to her mausoleum. The exact circumstances of her death are unclear, but it is known that when the Roman troops entered the tomb, Queen Cleopatra had peacefully passed away on her bed within the mausoleum, wearing a dignified expression and a faint smile. Several attendants also took their own lives in front of her bed. Queen Cleopatra was closely monitored by Octavian's military, and her tomb was guarded by Roman soldiers. When she and her entourage entered the tomb, they were subjected to strict scrutiny. How she died remains a mystery in history. 
Some say that she had venomous snakes hidden in a chest, secretly brought in, which bit her and caused her death. Others claim that she consumed poison brought by her loyal attendants, resulting in her being fatally poisoned. Plutarch, an ancient Roman biographer, described it as follows. The queen was bitten by a venomous snake on her wrist and died, with the snake hidden in a water basin beforehand. There is also a legend that it was not a snake bite but a hollow wooden comb that she carried, containing poison. The queen consumed the poison within the comb and perished. There are many legends surrounding Queen Cleopatra's death, but the truth remains unknown. After Queen Cleopatra's death, Octavian held a grand funeral and had her and Antony buried in the mausoleum they had built while still alive. Although Queen Cleopatra's physical beauty has faded away, she could not revive the declining Ptolemaic dynasty. However, her dedication to her country using her beauty and intelligence will never be forgotten. Originally, the vast empire left by Alexander the Great had been divided into three kingdoms, Macedonia, Syria, and Egypt. Eventually, in 146 BCE, Syria also became a vassal of Rome, leaving Egypt as the only realm governed by Cleopatra. She held the ancient kingdom until 30 BCE. Not only that, but she also had a period of shared power with Caesar, instigated the division between Antony and Rome, and even planned to establish a great empire in the east with Antony. Although her aspirations ultimately failed, her influence on the history of Egypt and Rome was significant, and her story remains a testament to the captivating power of beauty throughout history.